Hi, welcome to Average Man's Spiritual Quest. I'm your host, Benedict. In our last video, we explored the fantastic story of Jesus studying in India, following his journey with maps and pictures and things. And we met the man who introduced this story to the world outside of India, Nicholas Norovich. If you haven't seen the previous video, I suggest that you do that first. I provided the link below. Despite the plausibility of this story, and its wonderful ramifications, many find it too fantastic to believe, or especially in established seminaries and academia, downright consider it a cheap, sensationalistic hoax perpetrated by a froster, opportunist, and a charlatan. So what's not of it all these? Remember, we're jurors who are not interested in some outraged theologian's irate name-calling. We want evidence either direct or circumstantial, so that we can make a factual determination as best as we can. In this video, I'll introduce you to the detractors' claims and supporters' allegations found in a surprisingly well-researched book, The Lost Years of Jesus, published in 1987 by Elizabeth Clare Prophet. And then ask ourselves the jurors, are we being hoodwinked? Is this a hoax? Has anyone tried to verify the story? What are the evidence, one or the other? What are we jurors composed of average people supposed to think? Also, if the story is true for argument's sake, let's think about the devastating ramifications to some and wondrous ramifications to others. Fellow discombobulated, disconcerted, and befuddled average people lost in our spiritual journeys, welcome to Average Man's Spiritual Quest. I'm your host, Benedict. If you enjoy talking about our confusions on this channel, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the like and notification buttons. Norovich's 1894 book, The Unknown Life of Jesus Christ, was an immediate success, but at the same time widely controversial, except perhaps to theosophists. Theosophy was established in the United States in 1875 by Helena Blavatsky, another Russian. As you can see, Theosophy predates Norovich's book by about 20 years, and one of their central teachings is that Jesus was well versed in Buddhist and Hindu thoughts. We'll visit Theosophy in more detail a little bit later on in a future video. Enter one F. Max Miller, a professor of European languages and comparative philosophy at Oxford, a world-renowned Caucasian Orientalist, expert on Rig Veda, the sacred books of Hinduism, and so on and so forth. Miller claimed, having asked some missionaries and British officers, that nobody named Nurovich, with or without a broken leg, passed through Leh, the capital or the general region of Ladakh. And secondly, he also claimed that the devious Oriental Buddhist monks might have been having fun fooling a gullible but otherwise honorable white man like Nurovich. And three, he also questioned why this story is not found in Kangyur and Tangyur, the standard catalog of sacred texts of Tibetan Buddhism. As to the first claim, however, were the missionaries and British officers Miller allegedly talked to were, at which point in time, relevant to Norovich's story, we don't know. And secondly, boy, I hate to say this, but when he talks about the devious Oriental Buddhist monks deceiving gullible white dude like Norovich, who could be a gentleman like himself, a white one at that. I mean, we're dealing with a world-renowned professor at Oxford in the smack middle of Victorian England, at the very apex of British colonialism, which, by the way, considered India a jewel in Her Majesty's crown, as though India was a thing for British to pick up or collect. Of course, I am impeaching Miller's credibility like a trial lawyer here, having some fun. And as to his questioning why the story of St. Isa is not mentioned in Kangyur and Tangyur, well, first of all, I don't know why they should be. After all, Jesus or St. Isa didn't start Buddhism, did he? Or develop its canons for Tibetan Buddhism. To them, Jesus, if he was there, was just a foreigner who visited and studied with them for a while. Secondly, as Norovich himself argues back, uh, the Tangyur and Kangyur catalog lists only about 2,000 texts, whereas the monastery at Lhasa alone has over 100,000 manuscripts. I, for one, don't know what, if anything, Miller was trying to accomplish. 
other than just smudging Norovich's reputation. And according to a 1896 New York Times article, one Archibald Douglas, an obscure professor at Government College in Agra, India, went to Hemis Monastery in 1895 and met the chief lama there and confronted him with Norovich's story. <laughs> and according to Douglas, the chief lama, the same man who should have been the chief lama when Norovich allegedly visited with a broken leg, flatly denied knowing anything about the Norovich story or even Norovich himself. So, dear fellow jurors, who is lying? Norovich? Douglas? The chief lama? Was the chief lama pissed off at this insolence of this white man confronting him with the story the lama had told Norovich several years back? Was the lama trying to protect something from the prying eyes of the pesky white people who keep stealing their colonial subjects' priceless ancient artifacts and manuscripts? Hmm. You know, there were other detractors to Norovich and his story, but let's now turn our attention to some who attempted to verify the Jesus in India story. The key question for us jurors is, of course, do the documents Norovich claims to have seen exist at Hemis Monastery or not? I mean, we live in an era of CCTV, for God's sake. And it doesn't help that Norovich didn't even bring a photo of the documents he claims to have seen at Hemis. He claims to have taken numerous photos, but that his local servant carelessly opened the box containing the exposed plates and ruined them all. A juror's instinctive reaction to this allegation would be, yeah, right, a likely story. I am also reminded of a lawyer joke, yeah, blame it on the secretary. Ah, then came along Swami Abhidananda, a world-famous scholar and Hindu guru. Born in 1866 and fluent in English, was, guess what, a scholar friend of none other than Max Miller himself. Swami Abhidananda is one of two most famous disciples of the 19th century Indian saint Ramakrishna, along with Swami Vivekananda. Born in 1863, Vivekananda was apparently a genius, and he, along with Abhikananda, is generally credited with introducing Vedanta, Hindu philosophies, and, you guessed it, yoga to Americans. Remember the Theosophy movements starting in 1875 with Helena Blavatsky? Yep, it was all right around this time, with Swami Abhidananda, Swami Vivekananda, Helena Blavatsky, and our little Norovich all directly or indirectly contributing to the interfaith awareness movement of the time that were all children of one God, all religions are like different paths to the one and only summit, where the eternal truth is but one. These were some heady days in religion, I'm telling you. Anyway, coming back to our story, in 1921, when he was a celebrity in America, meeting people like Thomas Edison and President McKinley. Abedanand, in his 50s, set off to Hemis. There he was told that the Norovich story and the Jesus in industry were all true. And the Lama produced the very manuscripts Norovich had seen. Abedanand's account of his visit to Hemis appeared in a book in Kashmir and Tibet in 1929. By the way, the English translation of the relevant part of Abedananda's book is in chapter 3 of the book The Lost Years of Jesus. What's interesting is that the Lamas at Hemis treated Abedananda very much differently from the way they dealt with foreigners. They treated him as fellow Indians and fellow spiritual leaders. But unfortunately, Abedananda didn't produce a copy or a photo of the manuscripts either. Next attempt was by a world-famous Russian scientist, archaeologist, philosopher, poet, and painter, apparently world-renowned at the time, Nicholas Rurik. He was everything. He led an expedition from 1924 to 28, recording the folk memories of the people of different regions wherever he went. And as he traveled through Kashmir, Ladakh, Mongolia, and Xinjiang, yeah, the same place where the Chinese government is oppressing the Uyghur people today. Yeah, that's the place. He encountered 
Jesus in India story over and over again. And curiously, how Saint Isa, Jesus, extolled woman, a revolutionary concept back then. Naturally, when he reached Ladakh, he visited the Hemis Monastery. Again, he was met with denials and reluctance to talk, very much like Archibald Douglas and very unlike Swami Abedananda. But through persistence and his air of scholarly approach, the ice thawed and he was shown many manuscripts and the Lama confirmed the Jesus in India story. In this, Nicholas Rerick's son George's ability to speak Tibetan may have been decisive in breaking the ice. His book Trails to Innermost Asia and other books on this expedition were published from 1931 onward and the translation of the manuscripts Rerick saw are found in chapter 4 of the book The Lost Years of Jesus. But by this point, the public fascination had faded somewhat and Rerick's revelations stirred up little interest either for or against. That was, after all, the 30s when the world was rushing headlong into World War II, remember? And still, no copy or photograph of the manuscript. All that effort in writing books, but no photos of the pages of the manuscripts? Hmm. Then in 1939, Madame Caspari, a Swiss professor of music, and Mrs. Clarence Gasquet, a world-renowned religious figure, was making a pilgrimage along the same route Norovich had taken. When they reached Ladakh and Hemis Monastery itself, the local rulers and lamas gave them a free VIP treatment, perhaps owing to Mrs. Gasquet's international fame as a religious person. For instance, the lamas restaged the world-famous mystery play of Hemis Festival all over again just for them. Then at one magical moment, ah, the Lamas approached Mrs. Kaspari and Mrs. Gaske and presented them three manuscripts saying, these books say your Jesus was here. Madame Kaspari took pictures of the Lamas and the manuscripts finally. And these pictures are reproduced for the first time in the book, The Lost Years of Jesus. Unfortunately though, Madame Kaspari was not a religious scholar and had never heard of Nicholas Norovich's story of Jesus in India and did not examine or translate the text or take close photos of all the pages of the manuscript. Again, a missed opportunity. Tantalizing but wholly unsatisfying evidence for us jurors. Since then, the world has changed. In 1949, China invaded Tibet, annexing it in 1950. Communist China, especially under Mao Zedong, was an atheist state, and it is feared that much of the priceless ancient Tibetan manuscripts and other treasures have been lost forever. That leaves the Hemis Monastery possibly the only remaining place where the copies of some uh, such manuscripts still remain. So we jurors want to ask, why doesn't some institution, formally and diplomatically request the Hemis Monastery to produce the manuscript for photographing, copying, translating, and studying. How about U.S. government? But Americans remain deeply Christian, much more so than Europeans. I cannot think of a political expediency that would encourage either the Democrats or Republicans to do that, something that may potentially rock the foundation of Christianity, thereby angering their constituencies. How about Vatican? Of course not, for similar reasons. Yeah, there's a rumor that Vatican knows about this and has some documentary evidence related to it, but that's just a rumor, as far as I know. Besides, I hear it is near impossible to delve into Vatican's secret vault of records. And all the more so impossible for major Protestant institutions, because Protestants believe in sola fide, remember? You get saved based on faith in Jesus only, not your good deeds, and the centrality of Jesus Christ's resurrection in their faith. So what do you think, fellow jurors? Evidence sure looks inconclusive, doesn't it? Tantalizing maybe, but on the other hand though, 
evidence certainly does not seem to disprove Norovich's story either. Darn it, does that make us hung jury? But the story still floats around, especially on YouTube. Just look at us, that's what we're doing. But it has remained only a novel story. It has made no dent on Christianity or Christian doctrine whatsoever after more than 100 years. Why, you may ask? That's the monolithic strength of established religious institutions. It's such institutions that you visit every Sunday, where you meet your friends every Sunday, that may even employ you, that will give you a PhD degree maybe. Why would anyone really bother to totally upend the Christian creed and fellowship? For what reward? At what reputational risk to himself? If Norovich's Jesus in India story is true for argument's sake, some will be devastated, especially those types of Christians who feel there would be no need to believe in Jesus Christ unless he overcame death by resurrecting. But others may rejoice, exclaiming, Ah, I knew it, I knew it. God couldn't possibly have shown us just one window to salvation, Jesus. How about them Hindus and Buddhists? They must be valid too. And maybe in the higher spiritual dimension, Jesus Christ and Buddha are probably best of friends and having a good laugh over us right now. Fun thought, hey? Thank you very much. I'll see you next time.